Hello, I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel this evening, Michael Cabanaton, San Francisco Chronicle transportation reporter, and Michael Montgomery, reporter for the Center for Investigative Reporting and KQED News, and Paul Rogers, San Jose Mercury News environment writer. Paul, a rare form of mad cow disease spotted in California. How concerned should we be? Well, statistically, not very concerned. Uh, nobody has ever died in the United States from uh, mad cow disease connected with U.S. beef. Um, as we remember from the 80s and 90s, there was a very bad outbreak in England. About 150 people died then. There have been a lot of safety uh, processes put in place since. But, you know, food safety is a very serious thing. Um, a lot of people forget that, according to the CDC, 3,000 people in America, 3,000 die every year from foodborne illness. And these are uh, things like uh, salmonella, um, e. coli, other types of bacteria and infections. I mean, just uh, last week, uh, Dole recalled hundreds of crates of, of lettuce because of a salmonella scare. A year ago, 30 people died from uh, cantaloupes with listeria coming out of Colorado. Some of us remember the, the spinach uh, scare here uh, five years ago from San Benito County. So food safety is a very serious thing. The thing uh, about this mad cow incident, which happened uh, on a, a dairy cow that wasn't going into the food supply. And remember, you can't get from milk either. The concern is that some dairy cows, when they get old, are slaughtered for human meat consumption. They go and become hamburger. And so uh, the uh, USDA is investigating the dairy farm in Tulare County, where this cow came from, to see if other cattle might have it, to see if any of those cattle previously have gone into the food supply. And consumer groups say that this is exposing some loopholes and some weaknesses in the U.S. safety system. And there's a battle on for the dollar to do a better job. Is that what they're saying, uh, that they're going to need more money in order to be able to assure that we're safe? Well, you know, there were some reforms put in place after 2003 when, when the first case was discovered in the United States. This is only the fourth time ever in the U.S. that we've had a case, and certainly the first in California. But, uh, you know, the beef industry, frankly, has killed a lot of the attempts at reform, and there are stricter rules in other countries. So one of the things that has come up this week is only one in uh, a thousand cows in America are tested for mad cow disease. In Japan and Europe, it's most of the cows. Uh, you know, you have, the cow has to be dead when you test it. it. It costs, I don't know, $20, $30 for each cow. So when you start talking about tens of millions of animals, that's a lot of money. And then the question would be who pays? USDA and the industry say, look, there's never been anybody die. This is incredibly rare. Our practices are working. And consumer groups are saying, no, no, we don't know if we're not testing other animals. You know, is this the only one out of the 34 million cows slaughtered a year, the only one that we just randomly got lucky and tested and found it in? What, Paul, so you, you got that, that to that point in your piece, uh, one of your stories earlier this week. You quoted one state ag official who's saying the system's working. This mm -hmm. proves the system's working. And yet, what, it was a lucky catch because there, what's the numbers? 40,000 are tested out in the... 34, 34 million. So... One in a thousand. So, and you have consumer groups saying, wait a minute, what does this say? It's, so it's a great debate. I mean, the debate is, were we lucky with this one that we randomly tested, or um, does it show that the system works? And the USDA points out, you know, these um, mathematically, uh, right after the 2003 case, we increased tenfold the number of cattle in America that we that we test every year. It went from 40,000 to 400. And we did that for a couple of years and only found two cases. Now, um, I think you can make a pretty good argument that when 3,000 people a year are dying from E. coli and salmonella and other diseases, and we haven't had one yet die from mad cow, that people not ought to get too worried and too worked up about it. But I, I, I also think that you know one of the main shortcomings this has exposed is that unlike most other large beef exporting countries like Canada, for example, um, you know Argentina, other countries, the United States does not have a system where we can track cattle from the time they're born to the supermarket. And what that means is that when there's a problem, like mad cow or when there's a E. coli outbreak, it's very difficult to quickly track back where that animal came from. And the reason we don't have that 
tough standard to find the farm and quarantine it and make sure no, no other cows come from it, is that the beef industry has fought it. They say it's federal intrusion, it's cumbersome, the tags cost two or three dollars each, they'd rather brand the animals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some people think it's that they're trying to avoid the taxes and not having the federal government know exactly how many animals they have. Be that as it may, the Obama administration is putting a new rule in place this year for the first time to require tracking, but it's only if the animal crosses state lines. So consumer groups say, you know, uh, all the other countries, big countries, do it for every animal. Why can't we? Is there any indication that this is a larger or more widespread problem in California? Um, I, I don't think uh, we know yet. You know, you've got all these guys right now from USDA who are crawling all over this still secret dairy farm in Tulare County. They're not saying where it is. And they're going to be doing things like testing to see uh, and checking every bit of paper, checking to see was any animal sick? Are mm -hmm. they displaying any of the signs of mad cow? And if they find one other animal that looks like it has this, uh, I would say they will probably kill every cow on that farm. It could be tens of thousands because this is the California's big dairy area. At the same time, we need to remember this is a very unusual strain of this disease which doesn't come from eating infected feed, meaning feed made from other cattle parts, which is illegal mm -hmm. but occasionally can slip into the food. They, some scientists think this just happens spontaneously where the proteins in the brain behave strangely and they, they cause a disease. So we don't know a lot yet, but you know, as for now, it's only the one cow. Okay. okay, so we know the one cow, we know they're still testing, and, and you're saying that this was a very unusual and a rare event. I had a hamburger for dinner tonight, <laughs> but if we learn too much more, I might be having the tofu burger next week. Well, Michael, when we return to you, you have talked to, you are here to talk to us about um, one event that's taken many, many years of talk and discussion, and that is a real change in the way we handle the criminal justice system, in particular prisons. So. Tell us about the prison overhaul and what it's me going to mean to all of us. Right. So we had the corrections officials this week announcing uh, a pretty major strategic plan uh, moving forward to uh, continue to reduce the inmate population, to bring the budget down significantly. Just to throw out a number, the CDCR's current budget is $10 billion. Um, I got to read this because it's uh, it, it went from 3% of the general fund to 11% of the general fund in 30 years. This plan would bring that down to about 7.5%. Now, the thing is, we've heard plans like this before. There was a plan five years ago that looked great on paper, put together by smart people, well-intentioned academics and others. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, it ran into reality with fiscal problems and what have you. The difference today is there's some momentum. We've got realignment that started in October. It's already brought down the prison population by about uh, 22,000 inmates. That in and of itself is making all sorts of things possible within the prison system that weren't possible before. So this plan is essentially going to try to ride on the coattails of realignment. Well, explain realignment, number so, one, which is the key here to it. Well, and this is the governor's one of his success. big uh, uh, initiatives. A real lime essentially shifts the responsibility for certain uh, inmates, certain felons from the state to the county, both for parole and if they commit another crime, a low level crime. And so, because we've had that shifting or diverting of, of felons f from the state to the counties, this is why we're seeing such a drastic drop in the inmate population. You know, they call it the churn rate. These are people who go into the prison system maybe for two weeks, two months, and they're out again, and they're in again, and they're out again. So they're trying to sort of slow that revolving door. One of the concerns is, is the system, is the state system sort of passing on its problems to the counties? Are we going to see overcrowded county jails instead of overcrowded state prisons? That's one of the worries. The other worry is, will there be the money, the continuing money to, to fund a lot of this. We've been doing realignment for six or seven months now. What is the answer? What are we seeing? I mean, uh, is the crime rate going up? Are the county prisons getting overcrowded? What's happening so far? Well, the, the, the big headline is we're, we are seeing a significant reduction in the population at the state level. So uh, it's working in that sense. I've talked to different folks in different counties. It's, it's it, not surprisingly, it's playing out unevenly. You've got counties in San, like San Francisco that are really kind of prepared for this. Other counties that aren't. You've got some counties that have uh, population caps on their jails. Uh, and they've been having to make decisions on early releasing some some uh, people convicted or awaiting uh, trial. So it's playing out even, unevenly. There haven't been any horror stories yet. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the idea is that this applies only to people whose most re recent offense is non-violent, non-sex uh, related. There was really quite a dust up down in Los Angeles, though, about this. Uh, 
where uh, real strong objections to having this take place. Well, there's concerns, of course, about the LA jail system. I mean, there's been big problems there, and it's not the only one in the state. So uh, it, it's part of this question of can counties uh, handle this responsibility, and will the state have the money uh, to, to continue to fund it? Now, how well thought out is this, given that if we, it's been discussed for years? Is this uh, a well-considered plan, or is this, you know, sort of your typical Sacramento pass the budget, cut the budget, shuffle? You know, I talked to a lot of people about that this week in Sacramento. I think generally it's getting good marks. It, it, it's aggregating things, ideas that have been around, and things that have actually been in place. So a lot of these things aren't completely new. But w one thing they're doing is they're taking some of their liabilities and turning them into assets. Here's an example: uh, the state's classification system was shown to be overclassifying inmates. That is, they were putting them in high security units when maybe they didn't need to be in those. This, under this plan, they will move a lot of those inmates into lower security facilities because they're not considered a big risk. That will save lots of money. Um, there's all sorts of other ways they're finding uh, cost savings, if you will. Okay, there's, um, there are two uh, issues that will be on the ballot this November, just qualified. Uh, those should save money. Explain that. Well, and this is this goes to you know this really isn't just about realignment. It's about changing fundamental changes in our criminal justice system. The first uh, uh, ballot initiative would would abolish uh, capital punishment, and uh, that's costing estimates are about 184 million dollars a year. There's 720 people on death row. There's only been 13 executions in 34 years. Some of the money saved will supposedly go. Uh, to help solve homicide and rape cases. That's at least what the ballot initiative supporters are saying. The other is three strikes. There's a initiative that the supporters say is qualified that will change three strikes and uh, arguably reduce some of its, uh, some of its sentencing structures. And three strikes was a, a sentencing structure that uh, made it very difficult for anybody to ever be paroled again. They were there for life. Correct. And this will uh, modify it so people convicted of a third felony wouldn't be sent away for 25 to life and if it's a if it's a lower level felony. And finally, felony. does this settle the uh, court cases over overcrowding and lack of sufficient health care? We will see. The department has to get the population down to 110,000 by 2013. They'll be close, but they may miss that mark and have to ask the court for a little bit of uh, wiggle room, if you will. Well, lots of going on there, but not as much as what's going on in just minutes away <laughs> <laughs> over at Doyle Drive. <laughs> That's right. The fun has already begun. It's going to be a uh, loud, dusty, and noisy weekend for people over uh, uh, over alongside Doyle Drive and the Presidio and at Chrissy Field. It will be, uh, as uh, someone told me today, it will be the noisiest national park in the country this weekend. Um, starting at 8 o'clock, uh, Doyle Drive will be demolished. They're going to close it down. They've already closed the uh, the marina on ramps and uh, it'll disappear after 75 years. It was built along with the Golden Gate Bridge and for, about, for a long time it's been considered too narrow, too seismically fragile and in need of replacement. And so they're going to start replacing it with the Presidio Parkway, which is a uh, long battled, carefully designed a uh, combination of three tunnels, two bridges. It's scenic. It'll cost $1.1 billion and should be open in about three years. About half of it is built already. And starting Monday, people are going to find something entirely different when they, uh, when they approach Doyle Drive. Well, we can see uh, an animation of what it is that going to look like or is in the process now. Of, uh, right now, this po portion here is already built. This is a new, uh, a new sort of Y intersection, um, and this is now we've we've shifted. We're heading from the Golden Gate Bridge south. This is along the current Doyle Drive. We're approaching Highway One, and uh, or Presidio Parkway, which will split off to the right here. And going straight ahead, you're traveling across a new high viaduct that's been built and heading into a tunnel. It's called the Battery Tunnel, and it's one of three tunnels that will exist along the way. Um, heading through the tunnel, you come out onto a, uh, uh, there's an embankment here, and then you'll head onto a temporary bypass that's being built in the area that's right behind the sports basement and some of the old buildings that are uh, at the Presidio. But so, uh, we're just sort of reaching the end here, and uh, uh, you know, then you come out at the Palace of Fine Arts. 
I was amazed to see, Michael, when they, we all remember when that bridge fell down in Minnesota, uh, right. whatever, five or six years ago, and uh, the Department of Transportation has the, has the list where they rank all the bridges in the United States one to a hundred on uh, how safe they are and how likely they are to collapse. When uh, journalists went and looked up the bridges in California, they saw that Doyle Drive was a two, two mm -hmm. out of 100. Um, I guess the worst in the state of California? I had no idea it was that bad. It was the worst in the state of California and the second worst in the nation. I can't remember what the first was. Wow. But it had, uh, as you said, I think it scored a two or a three on the scale. And the bridge that collapsed in Minnesota was somewhere in the range of the 20s. So we were very lucky that this didn't fall down already in some earthquake. Right, and the, the, that safety rating does not even consider seismic safety. It's basically um, road safety, it was the narrow lanes, it was the fact that there's no median, and the the type of construction that was used. And the ever-changing approach of the, the yellow, little yellow markers in the road, so the, from day to day it could be something different. Yeah, I mean, even for people who drive it daily, it could be a terrifying experience. Mm -hmm. And just, so just to add to that, I mean, I remember reading that this was a, identified as a problem going back to the 50s or even further I mean why it's it's beautiful to look at this animation but why did it take so long I mean uh, literally you know, decades I, it's sort of a typical Bay Area or California experience which is I uh, you know it's a struggle to find the money you don't just go to one place and they say oh yeah here's 1.1 billion dollars uh, you know you sort of go hat in hand to all these different agencies and get your uh, your members of congress working on it and and round up money and so it took that but also uh, you know it goes through a national park it it was originally an, an army base so you have to be concerned about that and then there are people who say well you know i want it to look nice and uh, you know we should have a tunnel here and we should be able to walk from the presidio over to chrissy field now all those things are going to happen but that took years and years of of doing it and the person who designed it apparently uh, came up with the idea for it while sitting on top of the dome at the Palace of Fine Arts. <laughs> well, one thing we know, there'll be changes tonight starting at 8 o'clock. Ex uh, explain that one. But that's only the beginning. Then we're going to, this is going to go on over through the weekend, and then what are we left with? Or well, we'll have the new, the new alignment, which is uh, a temporary detour or a temporary bypass, which travels on the ground and it heads into the, uh, the tunnel and then the high viaduct. That's actually only half of the road. And then we can expect a protest over the weekend from Occupy also? Well, probably not over the weekend, right. but they're, they're looking at May 1st, May Day, uh, also my birthday, by the way. <laughs> but, um, and as a, you know, that's a sort of a traditional uh, uh, labor protest day. And there is a coalition of, uh, of unions at the Golden Gate Bridge that are having difficulties negotiating a contract. They've been talking for a year. It's mostly hung up over health care insurance issues like many contracts are and they've enlisted the help yeah. of uh, Occupy people who are coming out and there's a, a question no one knows if they're going to shut down the oh. bridge or just yeah. yell and scream. Lots of activity down there bring a lunch or nice bottle of water so that you can be patient over the weekend <laughs> and your you're, planning to, <laughs> you're planning to cross the bridge.